first one was uh, really very interesting. And looking at uh, what you've been up to now, it looks like you've been doing a lot more. So I think this one's going to be uh, quite a bit more involved and a lot more interesting as well. So this is very good. So without further ado, I'd like to say thanks very much indeed, Kerry, for, for doing a talk for us. And uh, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me back again. Um, yeah, as I say, it's round two, basically. Um, last year, I did a very similar voyage, which was the whole of the UK, um, which hopefully some of you remember. Uh, this year, I just joined for the Scottish part. Um, so before I dive in, there's a couple of, I guess, housekeeping things. In the tests that I did with my mum yesterday, um, some of the videos, although they seem to be playing fine on my computer, mum said they're a bit jumpy on hers. Um, it seems to be to do with internet connection issues. So I apologize in advance if the videos are a little bit jumpy for you. Hopefully it's not too bad. And if you can bear with me, hopefully in the recordings, it'll play smoother if you can watch it back then. Um, there's also one of the, I think it's the first video, there is a bit of background noise. Uh, that was because I was recording it on the ship um, and the quietest place I could find was next to the fridges and freezers. So there's a very constant background hum. Uh, so I shall just get the screen shared. Um, give me a shout that you can all see it. I was lucky enough to join the Darwin 200 <laughs> 2021 voyage for the two legs going around Scotland. We got fantastic weather, so managed to get out and dive amazing locations like St Kilda in this photo here that puts our little tall ship into perspective against the grand backdrop of the epic sea stacks. The Darwin 200 project aims to retrace Charles Darwin's HMS Beagle voyage and hopes to train 200 young conservationists along the way and reach 200 million people worldwide, mostly using social media. There'll be five key project themes, which include habitat loss, global coral surveys, ocean plastics, cetaceans, and pollution solutions, PhDs. It is set to launch in 2023 aboard this beautiful tall ship called the Oosterschelde. And it will be a two year long voyage. The, they are currently open for taking applications if you're interested in learning to sail on this tall ship for any of the legs. However, the UK launch started in 2020 and I was lucky enough to be there from the start. It was a practice expedition circumnavigating the UK. It took two months to go around the whole UK and there was a team of young scientists aboard and again, five research projects. Here's a couple of pictures from that epic adventure. I did a talk about it last year. Hopefully some of you will remember that. It was amazing. And this year was just as amazing, if not more. The tall ship Pelican of London is the name of the ship we're on. She was built in France in 1948. She worked as a fishing trawler in the Arctic for 20 years and was converted to a tall ship in 2007. She's a mainmast barkentine setting 11 sails. So she's excellent to learn about tall ship sailing on because there's sails of all sorts of different types. She's a class A tall ship. She usually does sail training as her day job. And that's the ship that we used both in the 2020 voyage and this year's 2021 voyage. So crewing a tall ship, it was certainly a learning curve last year. This year, I at least knew better what I was getting myself in for. I, I was there as volunteer crew, so I participated in the watch system. I joined in doing helm and lookout duties. We scrubbed the decks, polishing the brass, cleaning the heads, not my favourite job, pulling on lots of ropes, lots and lots of pulling on ropes, and climbing the rigging was my absolute favourite thing to do. This picture here, taking, looking down towards the deck, you can see me just in the purple to the left-hand side of the main mast there. 
and the views up there were fantastic, especially when we had dolphins around in the waters. Now, this year's voyage started off down in England. I wasn't aboard for the first part of the voyage down around England. They unfortunately got some pretty rough weather at the start, as you can see in this photo here. It made for some epic sailing, I believe, but to be perfectly honest, considering the seasickness I got last year, I was quite glad that I didn't get tossed around quite this much. However, it let the salty sailors in all the crew emerge, albeit somewhat damp. They also had a bit of excitement um, when there was a bit of an emergency aboard and one of the crew needed airlifted. You can watch the whole saga on the BBC Saving Lives at Sea series. Uh, there's a section in one of the episodes, I think it's episode five or six, uh, you can watch what went on. But the Coast Guards all around England, after hearing about an emergency on a tall ship, wanted to practice doing lifts on a tall ship. So they had numerous requests and numerous practices with the Coast Guard helicopters as they went around the southern half of the UK. Unfortunately, there wasn't as much interest by the time I came aboard, so I have yet to see a helicopter do an airlift from a tall ship. I was somewhat disappointed to miss that excitement. We had mostly wonderful, perfect, calm conditions, sunny weather, ideal for getting to all our locations and doing diving and doing surveys, not so good for sailing. There was very much a lack of actual sailing. We did get a bit, but not nearly as much as in 2020. But considering the bonus of the good weather, I like I say, the voyage started with leg one going around southern England. I joined the ship in Glasgow for leg two and leg three. So we started in Glasgow and we headed out and down and round up to Staffa, down into Oban. And from Oban, because there was a perfect weather window, we headed out to St Kilda and the weather window continued. So we got out to Rockall. From Rockall, we came back to St Kilda and then up to the Flannan Isles. We worked our way down the Outer Hebrides, down to Barra, and then we worked our way up to Ullapool, dived several sea locks on our way down to Portree, and it was in Portree that we had a crew change. So the crew change was ready for leg three. For our leg three, we then set sail with our new crew up to Sufulaskur, where we did an epic dive around Orkney, did some exploration there, Shetland Isles. We actually caught Fair Isle on the way south from Shetland. Unfortunately, we didn't stop there. Um, it was a bit choppy and bad weather by this point. And we headed down pretty quick past the Isle of May, where we did a dive into Leith at Edinburgh. The weather was rapidly deteriorating, uh, and I had originally planned to get off at the Farne Isles. Uh, after the last dive, but because the weather was getting so bad, we were pretty certain we weren't going to be able to do the diving at the Fire Isles. So I took the opportunity and left the ship in Edinburgh because it was much easier to get home from there. The ship itself continued on south to London, where similar to last year, they did another epic finale sailing under the, the Tower of London Bridge. And everyone did a big round off party there aboard the ship. I was Slightly disappointed to miss the party, but definitely appreciated the much shorter journey home from Edinburgh back to Open as opposed to from London, like I did last year. We had several projects on the go, just like last year. The Seabird project, we were recording the Seabirds as we went around. The data was shared with the RSPB and the British Trust for Ornithology. And I believe 13 species were recorded in total of seabirds. However, there was some sad findings, such as the gannets being strangled using netting from fishing industry and recreational fishing and um, nets and fishing line, monofilament fishing lines uh, to build their nests. Um, 
there was several cases of gannets that it got tangled and sadly perished, tangled up in the nets, the netting that they'd used for the nesting material. Very unfortunate. And a, a prime example of unnecessary dangerous plastics escaping into the environment. From the projects, we created maps of all our findings. So you can go to the Darwin 200 website, it's just darwin200.com, you can see the link down at the bottom there, and you can explore the data if you're interested to see what we found. The maps are hopefully nice and easily accessible, you can search by species, and if you click on each dot, you can get more information about that particular record. We also did a marine megafauna survey. This one was good fun. Everyone loves porpoise and dolphins, you can't help but smile when you see them. The data was sent to the Sea Watch Foundation. There was 39 dedicated surveys during the voyage. We also took casual reports and of course, sad's law, a lot of the actual reports were the casual reports because more often than not, nothing would turn up during the dedicated surveys. There was 11 different species recorded, 155 individual sightings, and species included things like Riso's dolphins, white beaked dolphins, longfin pilot whales, which were fantastic to see, and orca. The orca themselves are a bit of a sore point for me. They pod with a calf, came directly past us as we were coming into Scapaflua, Orkney. I happened to be on the helm at the time, uh, so steering wheel of the ship. And because the orca are so exciting, there was a whole load of other vessels following them. But while trying to manoeuvre the tall ship and avoid these little vessels, one of which decided to cut right in front of our bow, so Captain giving me very rapid manoeuvres to execute, I only caught the smallest glimpse of the orca while everyone else of the crew were running around going, oh, look at the orca, isn't it amazing? So I am so pleased that they were there and I did manage to catch a glimpse, but I am so gutted that I couldn't appreciate them fully at the time. And again, we've created a map that you can have a look at and explore the data if you want more information. And you can see we particularly found a lot of sightings in the Hebride area, a real hot spot for marine megafauna there. And we got fantastic encounters like this minke whale, dolphins and porpoise, you could hear them calling through the hull of the ship, which was amazing. And when we got to St Kilda, to welcome us to finally getting there after two years of trying. We had an epic breach by a minke whale. It was quite the welcome. Similarly to last year, I was meant to be aboard as part of the support for the beach plastic science. My paid work, my daily job, is with the Grab Trust as the Beaches and Marine Litter Project Education Officer. And I cover Oban, Lorne and the Isles, and Middergyle and Kintyre as my role. So I was meant to be aboard to help advise on beach litter surveys and also providing educational outreach for the Grab Trust and the school children in Argyle. So I was using social media, putting out videos on YouTube. I tried to do some live videos. We did have a few technical difficulties, um, including lack of signal, and trying to get questions from the pupils of the schools through a dedicated email account. So the Beach Litter Project was a great success. There were several different groups and organisations all working together to make this possible, along with the young scientists actually doing the hard work. So they surveyed 47 beach litter surveys. Over 6,500 pieces of litter were collected, and 80% of these were plastic. Not much of a surprise there. Plastic is an incredibly polluting type of litter, it simply doesn't degrade. However, less than 10% of this was single use, such as bottle lids, wrappers and cigarette butts and so on. But it was slightly lower than we expected because single use is such a wasteful thing. We do find a lot of single use lying around. What we did find was 24 to 60% of the litter, depending on which beach we looked at, was from the fishing industry. 
So there's bits of netting, tangled bits of rope, that kind of thing. And this correlated quite strongly with salmon farms. So where there was a salmon farm nearby, we found a huge quantity of this amount, this type of litter. So I was mostly there to be part of the dive team projects. I'm a qualified scuba diver. I've been diving for many years. I'm a scuba diving instructor with the British Sub Aqua Club, and I've done my scientific diving course as well as my HSE scuba medical for this project. And it was thrilling to get to dive all these fantastic places and be part of this sort of research. So we carried out marine biology surveys using the sea search methodology. We did marine litter surveys recording any underwater litter that we came across. We were doing marine sediment core sampling uh, to analyze those sediment cores for the presence of microplastics. And of course, we collected samples for team science to look at, such as sea urchins, little nudibranchs, types of seaweed, starfish, as you can see here, because many of the folks aboard have never been diving. Some of them might have been snorkeling, but they've never really looked at these creatures or got hands on. So it was a fantastic learning experience to help people appreciate these creatures and value what's under the sea. We did, of course, put them all back as soon as we were finished alive. <laughs> we also did a lot of underwater photography and filming so that we could share the wonders. So what did we achieve dive wise? On the second and third legs that I was aboard for, we managed 20 dives. Underwater time of 21 hours and 13 minutes for myself. Longest dive was 93 minutes that I did. Deepest dive was 42.1 meters. And we did on average eight sediment cores per suitable dive where we could take these cores. You can see me taking one of these sediment cores there. So where were the locations of the dives? Well, we did Staffa, Cav Island, Isle of Rum, Battersea, Loch Bay, up at Sky, Loch Maddy, Loch Seaforth, St Kilda it was amazing to finally get there, the Flannan Isles, Sula Skur was a dive I will certainly never forget, Loch Caron was possibly one of the best dives I've ever done, Loch Torridon was epic, Loch U, Ullapool, Scapa Flow was an old favourite of mine, Balta signed up at Shetland, and finally Isle of May, round in the Firth. The first dive that we did was at the Isle of Staffa to the west of Mull. I got this video recorded while I was on the ship. I still have loads more that I've yet to edit. So I apologise in advance for the background noise in this video. The quietest place I could find to do any audio recording on the ship was in the cold store. Uh, so background noise courtesy of the fridges and freezers. We were lucky enough to visit the island of Staffa. Staffa is famous for its unique geology. It's got hexagonal basalt columns that were formed under immense pressure and heat. It's very popular with tourists. There is also Fingal's Cave there, which is a sea cave that you can actually walk inside. It's home to hundreds of puffins, which we were lucky enough to see from the boat. We got a beautiful day, so we decided to go diving. We got kitted up in the little tender, and to get out of the tender with all our kit on, we simply roll backwards. then descended into an entirely different world beneath the waves. This site had kelp. If you imagine kelp like a forest, 
where the fronds of the kelp are like the canopy of the trees with leaves. And there's all sorts of different types of kelp and plants living in the forest. Lots of creatures live all over the leaves and even eat them, just like in a real forest on land. And if you imagine the trunks of the land forest, well, the kelp forest, these are called the kelp stipes. And again, are absolutely covered in life, a very important habitat for many animals in the sea. of the kelp don't take up any nutrients. These are called the holdfasts. And they simply keep the kelp in one place. They come in many strange shapes. to its legs and it wafts around in the waves just like a piece of seaweed. This is its idea of camouflage to help it avoid being eaten. Some seaweed even look like a wig. Got a lovely view of a lobster got such a beautiful blue colour on it. And the entire forest's gently wafting around in the waves, just like trees blow in the breeze. shades of red. You even get pretty shells in this country. Here we have a sea urchin. You can see all its little tube feet sticking out. And this little fish here is called a two-spot goby. You can see where it gets its name from. incredible camouflage and blend right into the sandy sea bottom. This is one of my favourite fish to find. This is called a dragonette. different types of starfish too. This one is a big seven-armed starfish. And during our safety stop at the end of the dive, we were treated to the mesmerizing movements of Aurelia jellyfish, also known as moon jellies. 
but sadly our time underwater had to come to an end and we headed back to the surface. So our second dive was Cab Island at Tobermory. Um, any divers among you, this is probably one of your favourites. It's a fantastic wall dive, sheer cliffs underwater covered in all sorts of marine life. So a few examples here, a couple of nudibranchs and little anemones. Personal favourite of mine, I do love Lumos anemones. They're so pretty. St Kilda was, of course, a highlight. We tried to get there last year and didn't manage because of the weather. So it was amazing to get out there and see it. We did a landing and we managed to dive there. We did a full circle around the islands, I think twice um, on the separate visits that we were there doing drone footage and filming. And it was an honor to be helming the tall, tall ship. For this video covers St Kilda's Village Bay and our visit there. Again, it was aimed at the school kids. So hopefully you'll learn something about history here and enjoy watching it. We made it to St Kilda. St Kilda lies 180 kilometres off the west coast of Scotland, so it took us quite a while to get there. We were very lucky with the weather. We had fairly calm seas and some beautiful sunshine. People lived on St Kilda for thousands of years until the last of them, 36 islanders, were evacuated in 1930. supposed to be doing landings on St Kilda which believe it or not is actually just behind me but as you can see it's quite thick fog so we're just hoping we'll be able to get ashore um, and explore a little but yeah the views might be somewhat limited. You just heard there the bell in the background. Um, we ring the bell every minute during fog to just warn other ships that we're in the area uh, and not to sail into us. We did eventually make it ashore and met the first locals, the Soye sheep. They're native sheep to the island and they live completely wild, but they are studied by scientists, hence you can see some ear tags. And they're all over the island. After landing, the first building you come to is the store. This is where the locals stored feathers and bird oil and tweed that they created on the island. The villagers paid their rent in these feathers and bird oil. There is also a gun. It was installed in 1918 after a German U-boat blew up part of the village. It's one of the few intact guns in the UK. was summoned by the bell of the ISS Janet Cowan, which was wrecked on St Kilda in 1864. The kirk was built in the late 1820s and is a plain and simple style. Off to the side is the schoolroom. Can you imagine studying here? Inside the old style desks is where you would keep all your belongings. This is the teacher's one. They would write with quills of the birds that they caught on the islands using ink.
even on these remote islands, you would still have to learn your sums. Do you think you would have liked studying here? All the children from the whole village studied in the one school, so both primary, nursery and secondary all together. Luckily, the walk home was not far, just up the street to the main street. Everyone knew everyone on the island, so there was the McKinnons, the McDonalds, the McDonalds, the Fergusons, and the Gillies. All neighbours. Life was simple by today's standards. Everyone worked the land and crafted such as spinning and weaving. And this is largely where their income came from. Can you imagine living in this house back when it had a roof? There was even a post office where the men would meet outside every morning before going to work. And a lovely, peaceful oval graveyard with yellow iris flowers blowing in the breeze. birds played a huge part in the life here. The eggs were collected and eaten. And the birds were caught and used for feathers and meat. This was extremely difficult work as the birds live on sheer cliffs and have a wingspan of 2 metres. There are 1,260 small stone buildings called cleats dotting the island. They have turf roofs and were used to dry and store the plucked birds. You can see some of the turf falling apart here. They didn't have fridges back in the day, so this was the next best thing. Today, St Kilda is a National Nature Reserve and World Heritage Site. This one is called the House of the Fairies. It's an underground store from around 500 BC. Again, because they had no fridges, this was one of the best ways to keep food from spoiling. These red plants are carnivorous plants. They have sticky dewdrops on their leaves to trap the flies. And this 
is another of Scotland's carnivorous plants called butterwort. The mice here are much bigger than those on the mainland. Because they're isolated on the island, they have evolved in isolation. This is called island speciation. You can explore the islands, the ruins and the pastures, even the sea cliffs. Battered by the Atlantic, sweeping in. If you're lucky, you can see some seals hauled out to rest between their hunts in the shelter of the cliffs and the crags. All too soon, it was time to leave. to the tall ship to continue our adventure. So diving at St Kilda was obviously very very special and um, we only got two dives, one proper dive out on the St Kilda world. Um, I definitely recommend it, love to go back and um, it was absolutely amazing. There was birds came diving down to have a look at us, fantastic great anemones, nudibranchs, all sorts of crusting the walls, little jewel and enemies of all sorts of colours, all intermingling in great big swathes of colour. Absolutely beautiful. Uh, the second dive we did as the sediment coring dive. Um, not all that thrilling for things to see, but it was really good to be able to take sediment cores here. And it'll be interesting to see the results. It was also a great opportunity to do some filming off the sediment cores with the whole team down there just focusing on doing the coat. Rock Hall is a very remote, tiny little rock out in the middle of nowhere. Not everyone was thrilled to go and see it since they had to endure quite a lot of seasickness to see this tiny little rock. But here's a little video about Rock Hall for you to enjoy. Rock Hall lies 370 kilometers away from North Uist. It's one of the most remote islands in the UK. The UK claimed it in 1955. However, this claim is not recognized by several other countries. We traveled for several days to get to Rock Hall and had to wait for a nice weather window to get out there safely. The rock itself is only 17 meters high and less than 20 people have ever landed there. The longest occupation was for 45 days. The only permanent macroorganism inhabitants are periwinkles and other mollusks. Over 20 species of seabirds regularly use it as a stopover. Sadly, there was trawling vessels in the area, even far out in these regions. In 2013, there was four new deep sea creatures discovered by scientists nearby. It was very special to visit this lonesome rock, but certainly not somewhere that many folks bother to go. We then returned back towards St Kilda. So our next diving location was the Flannan Isles. Again, another gloriously sunny day. I took the opportunity to practice in my macro photography. So these are the little polyps on dead man's fingers. Some sea hares having a bit of fun there along with a bristle star. 
and I was interested to find this little crustacea hitching a ride on the jellyfish there. Loch Seaforth, as you can see, the sunny weather was an absolute theme. Again, practicing my photography, a velvet swimming crab with this characteristic red eye. I do love my nudibranchs. It was great to practice photographing them. I absolutely have not got my lighting quite right in most of my nudibranch photos, but this one turned out not too bad. Sea lock and enemies are a classic in Scotland. Very beautiful to see. North Uist, quickly running through the dives, was another special one. Like I say, every dive was pretty much special, but North Uist particularly because they were merle beds here. So merle, this purple calcareous algae, is an excellent indicator of the health of a site. You only get merle where the waters are considered fairly clean. Um, we were doing some filming, hopefully to put together a documentary about Britain's islands. And um, we were doing some pieces to camera here showing the merl beds uh, with the full face dive masks and the comms. And it was my turn to be in front of the camera with the merl beds. <laughs> Isle of Rum. I was really excited to dive the Isle of Rum. It's somewhere I've always wanted to dive. I really <laughs> happened to pick a location that turned out to have been trolled in the not so distant future. We don't know exact dates or anything, but you can see how decimated the seabed is with everything just smashed up and scattered around. This poor brittle star clearly broken three of its legs that were starting to grow back when we found it. I'm glad he's recovering. There was some interesting finds though. Um, sand masons were making their recovery and there was some excellent fish species that we would normally not expect to find at such a shallow site. On to a different dive site now, so Devonshire cup corals, absolutely beautiful to see, and skeleton shrimp you can see just in the middle here, there's little arms and antennae poking out the top there. It's lovely to see them, you do have to look very close though. Candy striped worms, they're always fantastic to watch, mesmerizing with their floating sides. Alapool, great site for sea lock enemies, lots of sea lock enemies. Cushion stars always catch the eye with their vivid colors in your tar site. And Loch Torridon, this was a very tidal site. We were diving in the narrows between the upper and lower basins where the tide just rips through. So there was some excellent bryozoans, nudibranchs as you can see there, lots of brittle stars and I do love a butterfish. Loch Cairn was one of my absolute favourite dives of the trip and possibly ever. We had several habitats all in the one dive so we started on a kelp bed with fish life, lots of different seaweeds in the go and if you look closely you could find flame shells so most of this kelp forest was a flame shell bed and the flame shells are excellent habitat builders with their, I think it's hibiscus threads they're called, that they extend out to create little nests for themselves that then become the strata for other animals and organisms to live on. This then morphed, we had a, a shoal of sand eels go by and morphed into a rock wall covered in dead men's fingers as the tide took us on a nice drift dive around the corner. Again, I do love a cushion star. This one's got little protrusions sticking out this time. And fantastic nudibranchs that you can see here, perfectly disguised amongst the dead men's fingers. Love you. We've met an impressive edible crab. Sula Skur had beautiful jewel and enemies again, just like St Kilda. It was a very exposed site. Uh, it was quite a story. We didn't find the cave until right at the end. It had quite a lot of current and down drafts on the go to deal with. So it was a mixed dive of amazing things and frustration. <laughs> there was also lovely 
dogfish, I automatically call them, but they're now called spotted cat sharks. So it was privileged to see them around. Scapa flow in Orkney, we of course dive the wrecks, um, but I particularly, as I said before, love a plumos anemone. This was on one of the wrecks. Uh, the juvenile fish use them as habitat for shelter. Uh, wrecks are excellent habitats for young fish to grow up on nurseries. Um, and here it's almost a bit trippy with all the fish swirling over this part of the wreck. And finally, Isle of May, a buddy in the background there doing his own filming and photography. Um, and this is a feather star in the foreground. Feather stars are related to starfish and sea urchins, but they have these very delicate feathery arms that they use to filter feed from the water. And to finish off the whole trip, we spotted a monkfish on this last dive. Absolutely fantastic to see one of these guys not on the dinner table. <laughs> We had fantastic fun and worked very hard during the trip. It was one of those adventures where it's exhausting, it's hard work. You often question why you're there and balance it entirely with amazing experiences, meeting fantastic people and having incredible, incredible places to visit and explore. So it was a fantastic opportunity to do amazing dives as well as practicing my photography skills. I've not quite got the perfect backward roll splash shot just yet. Caught a few key moments from other members, but still a way to go before professional standards by some of the other team members, such as this one taken on St Kilda. Beautifully set up and captures the moments perfectly. To round off this whirlwind talk, I've got a fun video made by Andy Clark. Um, he shared this on YouTube for you to enjoy, uh, just to show just what an amazing experience it was and how much fun we had on board making so many amazing
lighthouses. Well, yeah. Stories. Teamwork, great laugh. There's always going to be cross dressing on a tall ship, and always, always look out for the engineer. So, the future. The Darwin 200 Global Voyage, they just last week opened applications for joining them as a sail, sail training person uh, on the legs during the, the global voyage. So please do check out the website if you're interested in that. Watch more videos on the Grab Trust YouTube channel. Just search for us, Beaches Marine Litter Project or Grab Trust should show us up. Um, I shared several videos there during the trip. I've put a few up since and I still have many, many more to edit. We also have general grab trust videos of all kinds of things to help you reduce your waste and live a more eco-friendly life in Argyle. So please do check that out. And of course, we support you to do your own beach cleans and surveys as part of the grab trust. We have equipment that you can borrow. So please do get in touch if we can help with that or even just provide some advice. And I definitely encourage any of the divers out there to get involved with the sea search surveys. It's a fantastic way to learn about the marine life that lives around our shores and to feel you've achieved and found so much more on your dives so thank you very much everyone for having me here today i hope you've enjoyed it and learning about this trip and i hope you get to enjoy your own amazing adventures such as this that you didn't even see coming when you were Sorry. Thanks very much indeed for that, <laughs> Kerry. It was very, very interesting and really well done. So I think you deserve a good round of applause from all of us. Thank you very much indeed for that. It was really, really good and very interesting indeed. Mm -hmm.